Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm delighted you can make it. Um, my name is Danny. I'm uh, the Library Engagement Officer at the Welcome Collection, um, and we are live from my home in Maidstone in Kent, in the UK. So it would be lovely if you could tell us a little bit about where you're uh, from today. Nice to get a sense of who our audience is. Um, I am a white male. I'm wearing uh, glasses and I have a greyish beard. I'm wearing a blue patterned shirt and behind me is uh, a door and white walls. My pronouns are he <coughs> and him. Tonight I am delighted that we have Dr Bonnie Evans. I think Bonnie and I have kind of, our paths have crossed over various conferences in the past, so I was really pleased that she uh, agreed to do a talk with us um, and what focuses on a really interesting uh, topic as well. The format this evening is, I'm going to hand over to Bonnie uh, in just a minute. Uh, we're going to have a talk with some slides and some video. And then we are going to open up the floor to questions um, or maybe comments as well from you, the audience. And we would really appreciate um, any feedback and any questions um, as we go along this evening. And then we scheduled to finish in about an hour. Um, these always seem to fly by, so uh, I hope we can uh, we can pack a lot in uh, in the next uh, in the next hour. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bonnie Evans is a senior researcher at Queen Mary University, uh, University of London. Um, she is the author of an important work on autism, which I thoroughly recommend. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to recommend Bonnie's uh, Twitter account as well, which has got some really interesting links to um, various things. Um, I particularly liked as a BBC produced programme about intelligence. Um, so do check that out if you're interested. And tonight I'm really pleased uh, that we have Russell and Lynn joining us for BSL interpretation. Thank you in advance to them. So I think um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Bonnie Evans, uh, who will be starting off. Just give us a little picture, Bonnie, of, of where you are, if that's OK. Thank you. So, hello, I'm Bonnie. I'm in London. I am a woman wearing a blue dress. I've got long blonde hair. I've got some jewellery on. And in the background, I have a bookcase with lots of books, which are my favourite books with the brightest colour. <laughs> brightest colours. Um, so uh, this is a, what I'm going to present to you today is work that developed from a welcome funded collaborative project that I was part of. And in that project, we were thinking about how new forms of neurodiverse cinema could be created in the future, and also whether there had been neurodiverse cinema in the past. Uh, that collaboration was with Project Artworks, which is a collective of neurodiverse artists and activists, um, also um, the autistic researcher Damien Milton, filmmaker Stephen Eastwood, um, uh, film scholars and uh, psychologists were also collaborating, and I was the historian who was doing the historical work. So for those who aren't familiar with the term uh, neurodiversity, it's a word that was coined in the 1990s by a sociologist called Judy Singer, um, and she used it to advocate for an appreciation of all people, no matter how their brains are wired, no matter what different behaviour they exhibit. And uh, it originated within the autism activist community, but it's become much broader than that now. And you see a lot of artists using it now, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, I'm using it quite broadly in this title. There's been a lot of talk uh, recently around how sort of neurodivergent people are represented in film and in the historical work that I was doing I, I sort of wanted to transpose that debate to a different time um, to the origins of film itself so what I'll be talking about in the um, 
main presentation is just the origins of film and early film, but I'm really happy at the end to open out the debate if anyone has any wider um, questions about the bigger project or wants to raise contemporary issues around neurodiversity and film. Um, I'm really happy to sort of open the debate out at the end. So, so could we have the first slide? Uh, so so as, a, as a historian then, when I thought about film and uh, neurodiversity, I just wanted to know really when were neurodivergent people filmed or involved in filmmaking practice? And what was clear was that from, you know, the answer is from very early days of filmmaking, right back to the origins of film itself, neurodivergent subjects are filmed. And I quickly discovered that France was the epicenter of this origin story. And I also went to France, to Paris, uh, just before the first lockdown to look at some of the clips, the films that I'll be showing you. Uh, but I'll also be showing you some other films from Italy, uh, Romania, elsewhere in the early 20th century. And these were films that were influenced by this original French research. But to summarize, so the early development of film technologies at the end of the 19th century, it was really seized upon by neurologists, people studying the brain, who thought that this could be used to understand how the brain directed movements in the body. And this filmmaking encouraged new theories also on the mind, on mental functioning, how we think, and psychology. And this led to um, some really interesting collaborations in this origin story, the origins of film, collaborations between artists, filmmakers, scientists. And one of the most significant of those was between uh, scientist Jean Commandant and the well-known film producer uh, Charles Pathé. And you may have heard of British Pathé or Pathé Frere. This was a huge production company. And they were working with neurologists really, really early on in the work they were doing. So film was a new method for communicating visual evidence, um, and it was really important in directing what was happening in the neurosciences as they developed from this point. So, and the next slide, please. So as some of you may know, the most renowned, sort of celebrated, famous neurologist in the 19th century was a man called Jean-Martin Charcot. Uh, he was most well known for treating what was then called hysteria with hypnosis, as you can see him doing here in this uh, classical painting from the 1880s. Uh, Charcot uh, ran a clinic and he had many patients who came in experiencing what he understood as hysterical symptoms. Um, these were understood at that time as originating in the mind often expressed through the body. And you'll see in some of the um, images I'll show later. But Charcot attracted a lot of physicians, neurologists and others to study with him at La Salpatria. Um, and La Salpatria remains a center for neurology. And what happens is in 1895, when the Lumiere brothers um, develop cinematography or film um, in France, La Salpatria becomes the center for the use of film to study human movement and how this is directed by the brain. And it's almost like there's a creative collective that's established at La Salpatria as artists, neurologists, filmmakers, all interested in capturing hum human movement. Um, and on the uh, right hand side of the slide, there's just some of the uh, people who were involved in this. Albert Lond is one of the primary figures who establishes this kind of work. He's pictured in the um, bottom left of this uh, image. Um, also Camilo Negro and Vincenzo Neri, they're both at La Salpatria, they become really well-known filmmakers. And by the 10s and 20s, this project sort of expanded, is expanded internationally, and it forms the basis for what we now understand as the neurosciences. So next slide. But um, before the development of film, you do see a lot of photographers at La Salpatria, and they're using photography to capture what they understand as hysterical bodies. So these uh, photos become quite well known. You may have seen them before. These are sort of dramatic quasi-religious displays of hysterical symptoms, such as these uh, of the famous hysteric Augusti. Um, but these images, they're often referred to at the time actually as a form of iconography, and there are links to religious art. They're sort of static images, and they're not really helping 
neurologists to understand how signals from the mind are directing the body, which is what they're, what they're trying to understand in this period. Next slide. Uh, so at the same, well, sort of in the early 19th century as well, scientists who were interested in this and in understanding human movement, its relation to the brain, um, were doing this largely through experimentation and also human anatomy. And these are some brilliant images from the Wellcome Library that illustrate that. This is an engraving by um, the physiologist Charles Bell looking at the connections between brain and the nervous system. And this study of the body was coupled with experimental animal studies to test reactions of the nervous system, um, especially the difference between sensory nerves or nerves that we use to touch and those that controlled muscle movement. And there was a famous uh, French researcher, Charles Magende, who uh, conducted these experiments on uh, dogs. And physiology at this time was a gruesome, gruesome enterprise that involved a lot of experiments on live animals um, cutting out bodies. But the next photo shows that that doesn't always happen in, sorry, sorry, so the next slide, please. Yeah, so once photography is available as a technology, um, many photographers and uh, later filmmakers, they become really fascinated with studying, observing and classifying human movement, how the mind directs um, the brain and how this directs the body. Um, and these technologies, they give people a new opportunity to sort of move beyond physiology, move beyond autopsy and vivisection. Um, and the moving images transforms these sciences, really. So the earliest neurological film that I found when I started my research um, in Paris was by Albert Londe in 1898. And um, that particular film is restricted, but it's part of a longer series that he makes on what he calls pathological walks. And this is from one of the earlier photographic series on that. And there are, if you go into the archives, what you see is there are hundreds and hundreds of these photographs and films that Lond and others make of, of people just walking around in sort of typical or atypical fashion. And the scientific goal was to observe and record pathological walks to see how they could be correlated um, with similar films um, or patient observations with the same movements or condition. But in the films at um, La Salpatriere, the causes you know, were unknown, and so they're studying the movement in a lot of depth to try and understand this. Next slide, please. So Lon's techniques in capturing movement were being developed at the time by Etienne Jules Marais, and Marais was, um, he was a physiologist and also the developer of this technique of chronophotography, which was the uh, origins of filmmaking, essentially. It combined images of movement on a single plate to demonstrate motion. And lots of the people were interested in this at the time. Edward Moybridge in the UK were also, was also doing similar studies. Uh, this is Land de Marais in the 1880s. And um, Marais is most well known for his photography, but he was also a physiologist. And it tells you a lot about the close relationship between human sciences or the medical study of the body and the technical sciences of photography and film at this time. They were really intertwined. So next slide, please. Yeah, so film gave sort of new ways to understand this relationship between brains, the nervous system and human movement. And Marais studied precise forms of human movement to look at how the mind directed the nervous system to create muscular contractions and movements. And a big part of his project was to study what he called the lost time between a shock or an impulse to move that came from the mind um, and then the contraction of a muscle or the movement itself. And he thought chronophotography could capture this lost time, what wasn't available to the human eye, um, this lost time between a thought and an action. And these are some of ex examples of his chronophotography. He broke down movement into the, the tiniest parts. And this, you know, this idea about reaction times forms really the basis for a lot of later work in psychological research in all its forms. So next slide, please. Um, oh, and Lond's chronophotographic series and later his films were really inspired 
uh, by Marais. And one of the one of the things that they were really interested in looking at was um, athletic movement and the study of athletes, as well as doing these other studies at La Sarpatrière with the neurological and the neurological clinic. Um, and the reason for that was because in these studies of athletes, you could literally see the muscles contract and move under the skin. Um, and that's why they're also using naked subjects in a lot of these uh, films. It's You can see how a thought, you know, move my arm translates into an action, how a body directs, uh, sorry, how the mind directs the brain and then the body. So next slide, please. So Long's work at La Salpatriere focused on uh, the observation and study of what he referred to as pathological movements as these manifested in any individual case. And this is from quite an early series depicting hysteria in a man. And as you can see in a lot of these um, photographs and later the films, it's almost a kind of gymnastic display. So the man stiffening his body, he kicks his legs out in front of them. He does this back bend, which is known as the arc de sec, um, which was very common in hysterical patients at this time. Um, as they were presenting at La Salpatriere in any case. And he finished off, finishes off with a sort of roll down of his spine. Um, but for the physiologists who wanted to understand mental impulses and how these drive and impact the nervous system, um, these were they saw these cases as brilliant examples of that. And so it's quite a complicated set of circumstances that bring together at the time photographers, neurologists and their subjects and their sort of, you know, observing um, these forms of human movement in a way that we don't see before this. Next slide, please. So just to come to some of the films, and unfortunately I can't show the long film, but I have some film by a Romanian physician called George Marinescu who studied at the Salle Patriere. Uh, and he was advised by Charcot to produce uh, moving images of neurological patients. And he worked on this, if we could play that again, maybe. He worked on this for 10 years, um, collaborating with artists who'd break down these movements into the smallest components and parts. And Marinescu wrote a lot on um, how you can observe movement in the mind, tiniest, tiniest of details to see whether or not um, a case was a hysterical case and their movements were being influenced by their mind and could therefore be, according to Charcot, um, hypnotized and, and their condition could be changed through this hypnosis, or whether this was a case that um, was what they call the pure neurological case, in which case um, hypnosis wasn't effective. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, Marinescu's demonstrating how this patient, well, he, he refers to her as a patient, who comes to the clinic, initially comes with this atypical walk and is then somehow transformed through hypnosis to have this typical walk at the end of the film. Uh, and this is something that at this time was obs obsessing neurologists, you know, and the study of human movement, they thought, gave them a really important uh, sort of uh, observational tools through which they could change their perceptions. And, and this is, a, well, sort of hysterical treatments were considered psychological treatments. It led to the sort of reestablishment of a typical movement. And there's a direct correlation at this time drawn between sort of typical movements of the body and, a, and what's considered a healthy or typical mind. Um, and that, that, that's what was obsessing all of them at this point. So next slide, please. So Sigmund Freud, who had studied with Charcot, uh, famously sort of turned away from all of this. He turned away from Charcot's theatricality, he turned away from the study of movement, he turned away from the use of hypnosis eventually to treat hysteria, started to focus on language um, and develop the technique of psychoanalysis. Um, but one thing that Freud wasn't interested in was, was movement, but the neurological and um, uh, psychological filmmakers remained very interested in this. So although sort of Freud moved away from this and in a lot of the history, the kind of story is told like that, actually, if you look at the films, 
you'll see that Charcot's work in human movement was, was still influencing filmmakers, was still influencing neurologists for a long time after this. So the next slide, please. So in the 1900s, La Sarpatriere remained sort of the center for this uh, filmmaking. The Italian neurologists and filmmakers Vincenzo Neri and Camillo Negro uh, work in Paris for many periods to develop their filmmaking skills. Uh, and Negro gives a famous screening of his films at La Sarpatriere and they're presented almost as a kind of carnival of human movement in all its forms. And they are aimed at... Um, they are aimed at, um, sorry, is the call still live? Because I've lost some people. Okay, is that fine? Okay. Um, thanks. They're aimed at um, not just neurological scientists, but they are also aimed at a general audience. And Charcot was the same, you know, you had people coming from all over to observe people in this way. Uh, Neri, in particular, had worked with Joseph Babinski, who worked uh, near La Salpatria. And um, if we could see the next slide, please. Um, Babinski was interested in sort of finding out which movements could determine exactly the difference between a hysterical and um, a neurological symptom. Uh, and he developed this, what's called the trunk thigh test, in which a patient's asked to sort of sit up with his or her arms crossed over their chest and in organic hemiplegia or paraplegia, the legs would then lift right up off the floor, but in the hysterical cases, they remain down. So when patients would come into the clinics, they were making them go through these sort of tests of human movement. And there were a lot of tests that they would put people through when they arrived at these clinics to sort of see whether or not their cases were hysterical. So if we see the next clip, it's from a film by Vincenzo Neri. You know, he's a young, it's a, it's a very short clip, so if we could run through that again. He's coming at this question as a young uh, scientist, and uh, he's trying to sort of understand how, uh, you know, how one could use film to demonstrate to a wider audience the difference between hysterical and non-hysterical cases. If we look at the next film, what becomes really interesting in Neri's work is that um, as time goes on, they would just become much more creative in their presentation of movement disorders. So they start with this idea, well, is it hysterical? Is it coming from the brain? Is it coming from the mind? But later, they just create these films that are just quite often very long sequences, uh, often involving different people. And you know, they are forms of portraiture in a way, they're forms of art. Um, if we could show that one again, maybe. Um, they're, uh, they're really, you know, this, this sort of pre representation of two men, it's really uh, quite a full on presentation, but there's, there is beauty there. It's almost like classical sculpture, but there's a little bit of movement in there. And it's kind of, that's what Neri is trying to present. If we look at uh, one of the later films as well, the next slide by Neri. Uh, if you can see here, this is Neri and he is um, producing electrical shocks and demonstrating that if um, a patient's uh, nerves have been damaged, then their arm won't move if they're given electrical shocks. Um, but if uh, there is no damage there, then their arms will react to the electrical shocks and stimulation. Um, and he does this on a lot, lot of different people. But if you look at the film, we're in a classical garden. So he's setting this up in a very artistic way. Um, I didn't actually show that the clip of a, a woman as well who's semi-clothed, often they're semi-clothed um, people in these, uh, in these films and uh, yeah there is there's a definite sort of element of artistry in all of this it was something that Charcot was criticized for the sort of artistic aspects of his work but actually it continues uh, and so the next film this is another film by Neri of a woman uh, who's presented here with involuntary arm movements and you can see here that she's you know she's engaged in the filmmaking in a way, uh, finding it amusing. We're not 
just observing or witnessing the movement. We're also witnessing the character of the case being observed. He also develops this technique of comparative film where um, he compares different cases with, often you'll find this actually that the sort of typical or normal person is featured in the middle of the film and, they, and they're clothed and then the patients or the cases on either side are not, are not clothed. Um, I don't know if you noticed in that film as well, there's a little cat that walks along underneath them. And I think this is, um, it's part of this comparative movement study as well. So the cat isn't moving in a natural way, but the, um, the other people are not. And so it's sort of raising questions around natural movement and non-natural movement. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so it, what happens in, by the um, 1910s and definitely during the, the First World War, um, this ki these kind of neurological uh, films, they're much more about sort of studies of movement and the mind more generally. So the question isn't just, a, is this hysterical or not? But how can thoughts direct action? How can the body serve as a vehicle for us to understand these things? And this is one of the longest clips that I'll play. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's actually much longer than this, but this section that I've chosen is about two minutes. And it's from a film um, from World War I by Camilo Negro, who's working at a military hospital in Torino. And it's a man class with what is called, then called shell shock. But it's a really useful illustration of how movement was uh, being studied in relation to the mind at this time, what you see is that the man, he's demonstrating these seemingly involuntary movements all over his body, including he does this after circle, a deep back bend. Um, but then this is also integrated with other movements which appear to mimic, uh, sorry, mimic combat itself. So shooting, collecting artillery, He's holding his body in pain as if he's reliving his experiences. Um, and this seems to be involuntary movement. In a way, it is involuntary movement, but it's associated with a memory. It's a direct illustration of how um, something considered a movement disorder is um, being directed by the imaginings of the mind. And as opposed uh, to Freud, it's the movement that reveals this working of the mind. And it's the movement that tells the observer the story of any you know, preceding trauma before this. The film is vital to doing this. Um, and there's a strong argument many people have made that the war, it's the growth of male hysteria essentially, that really begins to guide a lot of um, psychological research from this period onwards. Um, because there is, well, there's an interest in getting soldiers back into combat for one thing, um, and it, it means that there are lots of filmmakers and others who begin to work together even more on these on these issues. So that brings me to the work. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the work of uh, Jean Commandon and Charles Pathé and this collaboration that develops out of this. So if we move to the next slide, please. So what happens actually is Charles Pathé, he's working with Jean Commandon and they had initially teamed up to study microbes using micro cinematography. This was really sort of cutting edge research in science at the time. Um, and they set up this incredible um, studio to do this. It was this huge um, sort of, yeah, open space where they could conduct this work on microbes. But after World War I, they actually become increasingly interested in, in neuro neurological studies. And they make these really professional films um, exploring human movement. So next slide, please. So unfortunately, I can't show uh, the Commandant moving images um, because that archive is restricted, but there is, uh, some of the films have been photographed uh, in a published book. And this is a still made from a film by Pathé, uh, Commandant and Jean-Marie Sicard, who worked at La Salpatrière. Um, and he was known as the pain doctor. He was doing sort of experiments using different kinds of anesthetic and injections, um, as well as developing new imaging techniques. And this, this film, it, it shows a woman actually, she has a, a squint in her eye. Um, but in the film, Sika actually is in the film for a little bit. He's trying to open her eye, but she's squinting and she's in pain and she's covering her eyes. And it's a really intense like depiction of discomfort 
um, in a really extreme form. It's very difficult to watch, actually. Um, but it's a really interesting use as well of, of the close-up. I mean, the close-up in film is only being uh, developed at this time, but the neurologists are using the close-up to do something um, quite unique with their in their own work. And you'll see a lot of the films, a lot of the neurological films from the early period um, are using close-up, and they have a lot of interest in like looking at the eyes, studying uh, nystagmus movement of the eyes, different um, different conditions of the eyes. Uh, so the next one, please. This is another um, clip from a similar film of a woman's uh, face who's experiencing spasms on one side of her face. And the film's looking at her sort of uh, difficulties in talking and drinking. And it's, you know, it's a close up of her. It's really easy to observe her frustration, her sadness regarding um, all of this. So these are sort of closer up closer views of neurological conditions that Jean Commandant is developing, and they are kind of portraiture. They're also uh, part of an objective attempt to show a symptom scientifically, but they're also a kind of portraiture. Uh, next clip, please. And this is a still made um, from a film from Commandant. In the later period, you'll see these films become even longer. Um, this is a film called Multiple Sclerosis with Cerebral Onset. And it's around seven minutes long, but what you see is uh, during the film, this man is going through various tests. He's, he has to sort of crawl across the floor. Um, then Jean Commandant, who's pictured there, is pulling his, his shoulders back, um, moving his arms from behind, demonstrating lack of flexibility in his joints. Uh, he has to drink a glass of water. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it sort of captures all of these aspects of this man's movement, what he's able to do, what he's not able to do. Um, and it's, again, it's, an, it's a sort of, it's a little, it's a short you know, portrait of a man. Um, and so next slide, please. And um, yeah, this is another clip from um, one of Commandant's films uh, focusing on, on the eyes. Uh, and the next one is from a study of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, and I think sort of the point I want to make here in showing these photos is that really they are a great demonstration of the fusion between objective methods of scientific filmmakers and the establishment of subjective psychological approaches in the study of individuals. So in the early 20th century, uh, cinema became a really important medium through which objective scientific method could thrive, really. But it was also really fundamental to um, being the site for sort of subjective observation, the origins then of, of psychological theory. And in many ways, when you go back to this early film, you see that science and art were really quite indistinguishable. It's very different than um, the kinds of film that we uh, look at now when we think about neurodiversity in film. If we could just go to the next view, this is another film from the, uh, sorry, another clip from the film on Parkinson's and the next one as well, another. And yeah, these are, they're quite striking images, portraits of this man. Uh, and the next slide. And so in the later work, um, I think I'll probably finish in about in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, I'll just say a little bit about what happens in the later in the later research. Um, Commandant and others they become much more interested actually from the late 1920s in the study of, of children. Uh, a lot of the early films are of adults, but later on there is a lot of interest that goes into uh, understanding. Um, the brain, this is a, and children and development and how, you know, the differences in the brain are affecting children's development. This is a film uh, from, um, uh, it, it was, uh, it's a film about encephalitis lethargica, which is a condition that, or it's called sleeping sickness as well. Um, and it's a, it's a very long film. It features um, a lot of sort of long sequences looking at children who are who are suffering from this condition and it's quite again it's quite a disturbing 
film, but it's it's the first film that I've ever seen sort of that that does this, um, and it's a it's really sort of a fascinating piece of cinema as well. And the next slide, um, he also um, Commandant teams up with Edouard Clapaed, who is a uh, psychologist who was working with Jean Piaget, and he creates these films looking at how children are being tested um, on their reaction time. So if we go back to the early films that I was looking at where um, you know, neurologists were interested in reaction times, capturing lost time, uh, there are lots of films and, and filmmakers and psychologists who become interested in capturing this um, within psychological studies, and these are all being filmed at the time. And the next slide. That's just another clip from um, this film on childhood. And the, finally, the last slide, which eventually leads us up to this. This is uh, Arnold Gazelle, who is well known for sort of developing psychological methods by placing children into what he created, which is a little uh, see-through dome where filmmakers and others would be watching from outside. Uh, and you know, a lot of people see this as the origin of sort of filmmaking and psychology, but actually what I want to demonstrate in the presentation is there's a lot of work that leads up to this in the neurological films. Um, you know, film became really vital to structuring the sciences that we have that teach us, you know, how we develop our thought, how and our behavior, how we think, how these sciences define us. So and in this presentation, I just wanted to sort of show a time um, before, you know, these sort of psychological sciences became so dominant, a time before when neurolo neurology and film were just in their infancy and when there was a lot of cross and um, interdisciplinary collaboration between them. Uh, so, yeah, the last, I think I might leave it there because we're getting quite late. <laughs> I mean, I've gone over time a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, wow, so much to kind of think about there. Um, what I'm, what I might do is just um, allow people to send some more questions in. We have got a couple of really interesting uh, questions, and we'll just let you catch your breath. Um, I want to thank you because. I think I didn't realise quite how this period is so is so incredibly interesting because you do get such a mixture of things all at the same time. The development of electricity as a therapeutic kind of tool, yeah. photography and film, and the kind of really the birth of, of, of psychology. And it all... It's all happening in quite a, and in and in specific. I mean, I know it, we talk about, um, you know, the war and how there's different um, international interest in, you know, things like shell shock, but it, it's quite a focus in France, isn't it? It seems to be, and it's so interesting seeing how it develops because it does certainly help you, I think, understand how things kind of progress and how we perhaps move away from film as a objective scientific tool and it's become in the 20th century something I th if arguably something that may be more emotion we're used to being manipulated emotions are manipulated by film but if I may while um, we give people a chance to kind of maybe add some more questions um Oh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your um, letting us know where you're from. Hello to East Yorkshire. Um, hello to Rickmansworth. That seems to be a popular uh, source of our audience. And hello to our friends in Dundee. It's really nice of you to join us um, tonight. Um, I'm going to just use a host uh, prerogative and just say um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask a quick question, if I may, because I, I'm I'm really interested in the way the body has been um, represented here. Would, could you say a little bit about gender? Because we know, you know, hysteria has long been a... I mean, the word hysteria obviously comes yeah. from the womb, wandering womb. But 
we see an interesting development here. We talk about male hysteria and we see the male body. And you've got quite an interesting contrast there. You've got the, the really athletic uh, back, the male back that you showed us. But also we've got this body that is slightly out, well, should we say out of, out of control, to use a better word. And how does this kind of, um, how do you feel it kind of shows the different, maybe difference or similarity between, you know, male and female representations? It's a bit of a tricky one there. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, that's right, you know, the, the word hysteria comes from the womb initially used to describe um, yeah, madness in women in the, in the earliest um, you know, uses of the term. Um, but that's what's really interesting about what happens during the First World War, because it really does trigger new thought around this condition, because previously, oh, it was only women who, who experienced these mental symptomatologies and, you know, wasn't something that um, scientists need to concern themselves with too much. But then after the First World War, this triggers so much interest into shell shock and you see um, these films that are being shown, like the one that I showed you of uh, Camilo Negro, where you know, the men are very clearly demonstrating. It's not just something that the doctors are saying. I mean, Marinescu, when he would present these films, he'd say, I've cured this patient because here's a film, they weren't, they were sick and now there's one, they're okay. But, um, <laughs> but in the uh, later films, they're really trying to demonstrate in a lot of detail that there is all this suffering and also what the what the First World War was causing. It's creating all this suffering. And this is one way that we can show it to you. And, and, and that does then trigger a lot more interest into, well, what do we do about this? How do we think about psychological conditions? How do we think about psychological disorders? How much more research, how much more money can go into this? And John Commandon start their uh, collaborations and it, it, it stimulates a new system of thought around um, yeah psychological conditions because of the war and yeah male male hysteria what becomes known as male hysteria or shell shock brilliant thank you um so we've got an interesting question about autism i'll come to in just a minute but there's um and I, a really interesting question that's come in uh which also was going through my mind i have to say as well um is how much say did the patients slash subjects have in um, being filmed and shown to the public? I mean, this is, that's a, yeah, that's a really, really important question. It's something that came up a lot um, in the collaborations because, you know, there, what we understand now as consent was different then. Um, obviously, you know, people were coming to the clinics, they were, um, with these doctors, they knew that they were being filmed to the extent that the cameras were in front of them. So it's obvious that they weren't being sort of hidden um, from that. Um, but in terms of sort of modern understandings of consent, yes, it's very, uh, it's a very different period. And, you know, there were, there were different perceptions of that amongst the neurologists as well. I mean, I'd say Vincenzo Neri um, and Camilo ne Negro, they they maybe had sort of, yeah, the, one of Negro's films, he does sort of present this as, yeah, uh, as, a, as a kind of carnival for people to see. So it's like that kind of a presentation, obviously, you would not see today. Um, but but that's only, that was part of that, like, theatricality around presentation of symptoms at that time. And, you know, Charcot was renowned for, you know, you have all these people to come and see his hysterics and his displays. So, yeah, there was, that was happening at the time. Um, and it's, yeah, you, you can't sort of pull those things apart, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, there's a complicated legacy there for sure. Um, and, that, you know, there are a lot of questions that obviously that that raises around film, you know, who sees film, how do people consent, can people consent within film? I mean, a lot of those discussions did come up in the 
collaborations. But um, the way that we thought about it was, well, this film was made. It's there. It's in the archives. It exists. And it's, you know, it's important to know what was happening as well. It's sort of unearthing what was happening. Otherwise, we wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, and apologies if uh, the sound is is a, a difficult I think it might be my fan on my laptop here uh, but uh, hopefully you can you can hear me okay and it's not too distracting um, this is this is an interesting question Bonnie um, and answer however you you like because we we don't want to um, you know uh, talk about um, your your personal experience but there is this idea um, about say you know autism when I mean you're you're an academic and you're you're talking about something like autism and how do we make sure and I as a librarian I'm very conscious that you know we we have representation in our collections about the voice of the the person the person who is the lived experience of these conditions how do you sort of in your research and in your presentation, how do you make sure that we're not like you, you know, like we've seen the sort of the this distant observer that's kind of trying to do a scientific objective look at something that is highly personal and very emotionally involving in something like like autism. Um, how, how do you, yeah, just how, how do you kind of feel about that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's really, it's really important to sort of know about what happens and how, you know, we move forward with that. I know that um, the neurodiversity community did amazing things like transforming psychological research and then obviously autistic activists and other people have been involved in sort of shaping new understandings of autism and what it is. And, you know, I think that's one thing to always um, remember that this this is going on around us all the time and these ideas are changing all the time but you know obviously doing the collaborations I was working with Project Artworks who are um, neurodiverse collective and Stephen Eastwood who's working on uh, sort of reshaping film using neurodiverse perspectives and you know part of that work is collaborating with uh, neurodiverse populations autistic people it's part of the work and moving that forward and I think in the history it's not been as uh proactive as in psychology uh and that will happen it's happening now um and it's 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 great to think you know using these ideas that the neurodiversity has brought forward it's great to think it can help us think differently more creatively about um what's happened in the past you know it's complicated because actually when you do historical work, you're always being told you have to stick with the concepts that were being used at the time, the concepts that were being used at the time. So you have to do that. But then at the same time, if you're going to do, well, what Foucault would call history of the present or be radical and think actually differently and use historical work to change things, then you don't just do that. You also have to <laughs> draw from what's happening now. And the neurodiversity movement is an incredibly important movement that's sort of taking place. So, um, but, you know, you have to then <laughs> balance that with what historians are telling you about how you have to manage that. So it's complicated, but I think it's um, important. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think, I mean, in your, perhaps in your field and also, you know, as someone who, who works in a, in a museum environment, you're very conscious of the idea of narratives, uh, you know, whether you're rehashing a very old narrative with a lot of stereotypes and preconceived ideas or whether you're actually trying to take something forward and reframe and make people actually review and rethink their attitudes maybe and the things that have burdened us over the centuries um, and without sort of departing too much um, but I, I'm quite interested oh well, hang on we're getting lots of questions as well sorry um Right. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll come. I'll come back to that in just a sec. Um, but I do. I, I wonder how you, you, you just generally your thoughts and feelings on it. How, because we, what one thing that struck me was, in these early films, it's very physical. 
you know, you're looking at the mind and body relation. And I suppose when I think about neurodiversity now, I'm thinking about what is effectively more invisible um, conditions, you know, things like autism, Asperger's, that there are there are things there, but they are ostensibly not visible. Um, and how differently perhaps we we would convey that now in terms of of uh, well I don't I don't think there's a lot of sort of documentaries and scientific uses of film in, in, in exploring these I suppose it's more a kind of look look and an empathetic view these days um, are there any particular kind of films or yeah let's say films where you've you've seen um, a positive or interesting take on people um, that are you know inverted commas you know neurodiverse well see that's that's the importance of the terminology as well i mean neurodiversity it, it comes it develops in the 1990s in line with a lot of other you know a broader interest in the neurosciences neurodisciplines neuroanthropology neuro everything <laughs> everything becomes neuro it's because of um the uh, growth of the neurosciences in this period and also um, development in uh, genomic research actually that sort of triggers this interest in the neuro. So when you look back at the earlier film, how do you know when you're looking at something that's an associated with sort of neu neurology and the neurosciences or if it's more of a, it's associated more with the mental sciences or psychology. Um, so that's, sort of a question or that's how I would think about that when going back and saying how do we look at these films you're looking at you're looking at the neuro <laughs> if you're looking in terms of neurodiversity um, if that makes sense but it, there are a lot of I mean one one of the things I'm actually writing an article um, uh, with Janet Harbord that's coming out in, well, we're, we're making a, a journal in the history of human sciences on sort of film and, and psychology. And one of the films that we looked at in a lot of detail is a film by Elwyn James Anthony, who's a doctor that works at the Morsley Hospital. And he produces the first film of what he calls, what he calls then childhood psychosis, which then is reframed later as what we now understand as autism, but it's from the 1950s. So these terms are changing all the time. So to sort of say that something in the early period is or isn't autism is, is incredibly difficult to do. Um, uh, but in that film, what's really interesting about that film, and, you know, that does develop from all this, these films that I've been showing you now, but uh, is that it, it's used within the scientific methods that then are used to define autism uh, from the 60s and then also in the first, um, well, DSM-3 when it's sort of more clearly defined. So those observational methods are used to define, you know, these conditions that we um, now define differently. But these, the historical, um, work is complicated because you have to always try and find out well is this the am I looking at am I what am I looking at here is this someone else's perception of what is uh, a neurodiverse condition is this uh, you know a neurodiverse condition because it's being represented within the neurosciences is this a neurodiverse condition you know how do you how do you frame that that's a challenge, but that's a challenge that the neurodiversity movement sort of raised, I think. Yes. I'd just like to quickly, because we're sort of getting towards the end here, uh, mention a couple of, uh, I suppose, comments as well. And thank you very much for everyone that's that's taking part tonight. I really do appreciate your, your input and your involvement and your interaction. Um, and I think it's interesting. One a comment there was they thought that the because it's called film and neurodiversity, it might be about people with neurodiversity behind the camera and about their agency and that which I'm sure is hopefully happening um, yeah. but obviously that's kind of not not the subject uh, that we focused on tonight I'm um, yeah but uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that comment 
And if I may, Bonnie, there was a, there was a, an interesting question from someone who is a neurodiverse artist, and they were just interested in how you get access to, um, and you've kind of mentioned it, but how you actually get access to these films. And I wonder if you could just say, yeah, perhaps a little bit more about what, why they might have been restricted. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, uh, in terms of sort of the future of, of neurodiversity in cinema, that was part of the bigger collaborative project. But I recommend looking at Stephen Eastwood's work because he's working on a new sort of yeah, collaborative project looking at neurodiverse uh, film in the future. Um, and, you know, part of that was looking at how we have thought about neurodiversity over time as well. But that's that's the future um, and contemporary filmmaking. And then uh, uh, access, I mean, it's it, de it depends. I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier, um, that it depends on uh, archivists and how they um, see what is the purpose of their um, job, I think. I think there are some archivists who think that the purpose of their job is to uh, control the access to images and keep them, you know, safe but protected. And then there are others who think that it's important to put them out there and make them accessible and um, make sure that everybody can see them. And, and so access depends on, on that uh, quite a lot, but it's, um, it's possible to see these, these films. Um, you know, some of them are, are online now and um, that's changing, you know, and that changes also how we think about these things too, once they are available online. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it, it depends, it depends on which, but what, what, which particular films you want to see. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I, I don't know about our audience, but I have found this an absolutely fascinating um, topic and, and a really well presented um, evening. So thank you so much for doing this. Um, just genuinely quite, quite, um, it, it just opens my eyes literally to, you know, some of the, the quite disturbing images of, uh, of that, that's, that's all, that sort of shell shock victim. And then you see a sort of hand kind of come in and grab the leg and kind of almost like pull them back into frame. It's just so, uh, so interesting and so unusual to see, I think. Um, uh, just a couple of points, if I may, just to round off. Um, I mean, that's really interesting you're saying about that because as a as someone who's kind of a, a, almost like a gatekeeper to collections I should point out that um, sometimes with medical records there are data protection there are legal uh, sort of uh, you know frameworks for not allowing personal um, medical information of a living person to be sort of out in the public domain so there are some things that um, kind of T uh, tie up things but um, I suppose the other thing as well is that um, it's a nicely leads me into saying that there are a lot of uh, welcome uh, films that have been digitized um, that are out there so if people are interested in that kind of um, footage then the welcome collection website will feature things um, uh, not just uh, the sort of thing that, that, that Bonnie's looked at tonight, but also some other uh, footage of um, yeah, shell shock at, say, Netley Hospital, for example. Um, so do do explore that further um, if you like. And we're perfectly on time tonight. Um, uh, just a few words of thanks. Thank you to our audience for being so involved. A massive thank you to Bonnie. I am so grateful that you agreed to do this uh, for us so interesting and a big thank you to our AV team uh, who make all this possible and last but not least a thanks to our brilliant BSL interpreters thank you so much for coming and supporting us to make this a BSL interpreted event so Bonnie just any final thoughts or any passing comments as we finish no, I just want to say, um, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for the questions as well. It's always great to um, hear <laughs> what people think and um, to find out more about that. Um, and as I said, this research is going to be published in uh, History of the Human Sciences Journal. I've also got an article coming out in Aon magazine uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, 
yeah and yeah there's <laughs> and there will be more in the future so um thank you everybody if there's anything you missed incidentally this is recorded and it will be available on youtube so if you want to go back and pick anything up uh, that should be possible so thank you all thank you so much for joining us we will be back in july where we will be talking about happiness with sophie hannah but for now thank you very much lovely to see you thank you and uh, goodbye